Welcome to this sixth lecture on software test design. Today is about testing groups of variables together. I'll spend much of today on all pairs testing. This is a very useful approach and it deserves its time. But all pairs has gotten a little too popular. I've heard too many claims for too much. It's gotten too fashionable. So the last third of this lecture will raise some of the complexities that are hard for mechanical approaches like all pairs to grapple with. I'll hint at some of the alternatives. Today's readings are all about all pairs testing. If you get time, make sure you look at Microsoft's picked tool. So far we've looked at only one variable on this dialog, the page width variable, but there are others, and the program uses them together to control the display. I test simple failures on their own when I start testing a program, because I want to get the program past its simple failures before I start running more complex, more expensive tests that are way harder to troubleshoot. Also, when I focus my testing on a single variable, I can look a lot more closely at the program's error handling with that variable. But once I trust the program's basics, I want to test variables together because programs use variables together. And there are bugs that you can't find if you test variables in isolation. One variable often limits what you can do with another variable. For example, imagine a savings account. Suppose the bank doesn't allow you to withdraw more money from your savings account than you have in that account. It's probably by design, but it's two variables, how much you have, how much you want to withdraw. What if the bank's software has a bug that blocks you from making withdrawals even when you do have money in the account? Maybe because you made a withdrawal from some other account. You won't find those kinds of interactions unless you're testing variables together. The problem underlying testing variables together, underlying combination testing, is that the number of possible combination tests is huge. We looked at this in the foundations course in the section on the impossibility of complete testing. Let me remind you of one of the basic formulas in that course. Consider a variable v1 that has n1 possible values, and v2, which has n2 possible values, and v3, that has n3 possible values. If v1 and v2 and v3 are independent, then the number of possible tests of these variables together is n1 times n2 times n3. If you add a value to test to one of the variables, the number of tests in combination multiplies out by all of the tests of all of the other variables. So apply that to the page setup dialog. We have the width field. That accepts values between 1 and 56 inches in increments of 0.01 inches. That yields 5,601 possible widths. Then the height field accepts the same sizes, 5,601 possible heights. Then we have the starting page number. It can take any value from 0 to 9999. That's 10,000 possible tests. If you take these together, there are 5601 times 5601 times 10,000 possible tests. That's over 300 billion tests just for three little simple little fields on a minor dialog box. And that calculation ignored invalid values for these variables. By the time you test variables together, you should know what happens when you enter a bad value into a single field, like minus two into a page width field. The first reason to skip invalid values is that it is wildly expensive to add input filter tests. Because when you add another choice, you multiply that by all the combinations of all the other variables. The second reason to skip invalid values is that you probably won't complete the tests. You can't really test an invalid value of one variable with some other value of another variable and expect the program to finish it. What's going to happen is that the program is going to see the first invalid value, stop the test. The rest of the test either doesn't get run or it doesn't get run in the way that you planned it. So you're going to learn less than you expected. Now that's not always true. Sometimes with some programs, it is interesting to combine invalid inputs. But I pick those tests carefully when I know I have that opportunity. I design those tests one at a time entirely separately from the testing strategy I use for testing combinations of valid values for those variables. Here's a diagram of the possible page widths and page heights. All of the values from 1 inch by 1 inch to 56 by 56, they're all possible. With independent variables, I'm most likely to test at the combined boundaries. That means the corners of the graph. When you combine three variables, you get a cube. Again, if the variables are independent, I'm most likely to test at the corners. So I'll test the biggest page width with the biggest page height with the biggest starting page number. That's at one corner. And I'll test with the biggest page width with the biggest page height with the smallest starting page number. That's at another corner. 
This is simple boundary testing, just like we looked at in the last lecture. Actually, it's simpler than the last lecture because we're ignoring all the potential invalid inputs. This slide shows the eight corners on a combination chart. On a combination chart, every column is for one variable. Every row is for a separate test. Every test sets a value for every variable. So for example, test three combines a page width of one with a page height of 56 with a starting page number of one. Notice that you're only testing two values for each variable here, the upper bound and the lower bound. This is common in combination testing. You want to use the smallest set of values for each variable that you can get away with because every extra value that you add multiplies by all of the combinations of all the other tests. Eight tests isn't very many, but I'm using a simple example to make it easy for you to understand three different but related coverage criteria. The coverage criterion that I'm showing on this slide is called all singles. You achieve all singles test coverage when your tests cover every value of every variable. In the page setup dialog, you're testing two values for each variable, the upper bound and the lower bound. You can achieve all singles with only two tests. The first test includes the lower bound for both variables. The second test includes the upper bound for both variables. All the lower bounds are covered, all the upper bounds are covered. That's all singles. To achieve all pairs coverage, you have to test every possible pair of values. It's not enough to cover all the individual values on their own. That's all singles. So in the page dialog example, you need at least one test with a small width and a small height, and at least one test with a small width and a large height. The chart shows all pair coverage with only four tests. All triples coverage requires that your tests include every three-way combination of values. This example has only three variables, so all triples takes us back to the first combination chart. The last coverage criterion that I'll mention is all n-tuples. If you test n variables together, all n-tuples requires that you cover all combinations of all the variables. Here there are only three variables, so all triples and all n-tuples mean the same thing. 